My name is John Sylvester. I'm Australia's longest serving crime reporter and write a weekly column for The Age. Many of my colleagues have wondered why I've never bothered to move to other areas of the paper. The reason's pretty simple. I've got the best job in journalism, playing cops and robbers and getting paid for it. Over more than 40 years, I've covered some of Australia's biggest crimes and met fascinating characters on both sides of the law. In this series, you'll hear from them, the cops and the crooks, telling their stories. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Naked City. Back in the 1970s, the Australian version of the Hells Angels was a poor imitation of their American cousins. Hells Angels, accused of rape and perversion, theft, narcotics and violence. Most worked in the motor trade and might have dabbled in a little crime. They liked to wear their colours and ride their bikes at the weekends. They may have been dangerous, but they certainly weren't organised crime. Their convictions have to do with crimes of violence, not only against the general public, but against police officers. All that changed in the early 1980s when the bikies and the coppers ended up in an all-out war after the Hells Angels started a large-scale speed cooking operation. The cop at the top was named Bob Armstrong. Back then, when he was working the case, he was joined by another pretty tough copper by the name of Steel Waterman. Mr Waterman, there's a man coming from America to, to kill you and Mr Armstrong, and he's from the Hells Angels in America. Bob and Steele led the team. Steele was a detective on the drug squad, and he tells me what it was like before all this started. Hi, John. Hello, hello. Nice to see you. We have a long way. Long way. We do it too long. Steele Waterman. What a great name. Sounds like an American private eye. That's been going a couple of years now, unfortunately. Yeah, well, you were, you were in the drug squad back then, back in the early 80s? Yeah, yeah, I did, I did 11 years there altogether. And, the, and it was heroin back then, wasn't it? There was yeah, very, uh, very little speed. Oh, well, yeah, very little speed at all. And the only speed we got in those days was we had a chemist shop, Bergs. Yeah. So that, that was really all there was around, and heroin on the streets, but uh, very little speed. And that all changed when a private schoolboy, Peter John Hill, joined the Hells Angels. Hill was bright. Certainly, he was no knucklehead. And he was curious. Yeah. Um, tell us about Peter Hill, because he wasn't the normal type of a bikey, was he? No. Peter was the son of a very senior um, National Australia Bank executive. And I might be wrong, but Peter's father could have even been as high as number one. And Peter had a good education and a good mum, and his other siblings were good people. But Peter just had that, had this, um, had a fairly infectious sort of uh, character, personality, but he, he liked things that were a bit different to everyone else, you know, and he became a bit in love with the motorbike and the Hells Angels sort of thing, and he actually joined them before they were anything other than a bunch of baggy ass kids hanging out the front of a hamburger shop, <laughs> you know. But he went this is from a police uh, interview with Peter Hill, where he talks about joining the Hells Angels. Well, just briefly, would you tell us what uh, your involvement with the Hells Angels, how it started and so forth? Yeah, it started, uh, yeah. 15 years ago, I guess, when I was 18. Um, I was riding bikes, <coughs> and I, just through similar interests in, in motorbikes, and I got to meet a few members of the Hells Angels, and I um, subsequently joined. All right, so you remember the Hells Angels. He wanted to know about the Angels, and he chose to fly to California to connect with the mother chapter in Oakland. They loved him over there, and they actually took him to prison to see the Oakland's president, Sergi Walton who gave Hill an amphetamines recipe. Methamphetamine is made here in the USA. Who are its principal distributors? The Hells Angels, the oldest and largest motorcycle club in the United States. In return for the methamphetamine recipe given to him by the Oakland chapter, Hill sourced a key ingredient for speed called P2P, which was illegal in America, but quite legal here. 
It's quite a thick, sickly liquid. So he stuck it in three litre Golden Circle pineapple tins and managed to send 300 litres to Oakland, where they made 50 million worth of speed. This funded many of their major organised crime trials. Werner Sohn, James Colucci, Michael Vincent O'Farrell. We still have the appeals going. But they've been convicted. So we have seven out of uh, uh, a few hundred. Hill came back to Australia and through a process of trial and error, he taught himself how to make top quality speed. Here's Hill telling police how he did it. Just set about experimenting with manufacturing of to see whether we could do it following the recipe that we had. And were you able to do it? <coughs> um, yeah, very, very low yields, it was very low. And then we just um, kept doing it over and over again until we thought we had it where it could be a commercial quantity. Well, when you say low yields, you mean that the, the quality of the product that you were making was of um, what, a, a poor quality? Or? No, the quantity of product. The quantity. Yeah, we In 1982, they were ready to roll. After trial and error, Hill and some of the others were ready to cook meth on a big scale. They set up a lab at a rented property at Greenslopes. Hill tells police exactly how to cook meth. It's a complicated and toxic chemical process. Um, you let it, you drip it in fast as what you need to to bring it up to 57 degrees centigrade and hold it at that. If necessary, you'd slow the drip down so we keep the temperature constant. You'd pay. And they, they produced a hell of a lot there, didn't they? At Greenslopes? Oh, my Christ, you. Yeah. They were probably in existence for nine months before we arrested them. And they were doing two cooks a week, quite often. And they got to that stage where they were doing uh, five kilos a cook, so that's 10 kilos a week, 30,000, I think it was a kilo at the time. Uh, that's a fair bit of uh, money, isn't it? And they won Ted Slotto as well. Yeah, they did. They won 280-odd thousand for. Um, then in one of the other nights, you just put a funnel and tip you 2,500 mils of methylamine mixed in with methanol. That's they started the cooking speed did. regularly and made a truckload of money doing it. And they would have got away with it too, except for an elderly woman called Mrs Smith, a grandmother who lived across the road at a farm. And she noticed all these young bucks turning up in hotted up cars and contacted the local police. Yeah, she lived in the farmhouse opposite where Greenslopes was and um, uh, she's a nice lady. Um, she just used to, well, these guys weren't exactly discreet. They used to come in and make a lot of noise because they had, you'd hear a Harley motorbike coming from a mile away. Thank you. And um, after a while... I'm at Steele's house when I had a chat to him. That's his partner bringing me a cup of tea and a plate of biscuits. In the old days, it would have been a palmer and pot at the police club. And um, after a while, she got a bit jack of them because they wouldn't leave till two in the morning. They'd wake her up, starting up a Harley, and, uh, and then um, she went down to Heidelberg police station and reported them. And um, the guy at Heidelberg had the sense to ring the BCI, and that's where it all started. The tip eventually made its way to Bob Armstrong from the Bureau of Criminal Intelligence. You wouldn't know it, looking at Bob, that he's as hard as nails copper. He had this sort of cheerful, round face. In fact, he looked a lot like the comedian Benny Hill, which some of the angels actually commented on. But Bob was made of some pretty stern stuff, and he made some pretty good enemies inside the angels. Bob used to pepper them all the time. He'd pull them over, um, drive them down the road, he'd, he'd have them pulled over. In fact, one day he chased them and the guy drove into the Hells Angels headquarters at Fairfield. Bob drove in behind them. And um, they were a bit shell-shocked at that to think that someone like, you know, someone would have the stupidity to do that. <laughs> but he had them bluffed. Yeah. He was pretty good, Bob. He, was, he didn't take a backward step. And, of course, they used to hang shit on him because we still had listening devices around. Bob asked Mrs Smith if she'd jot down some car numbers from those knuckleheads next door. When she did, they all turned out to be owned by members of the Hells Angels. So Bob went up to the farm with the BCI locksmith. They picked the locks and had a snoop inside. They found a lab, a stockpile of jellic night, some detonators, a machine gun and several handguns. That was enough. So in 1982, police set up a task force called Amiga and they went to war with the Angels. 
Now, the task force knew the Hells Angels were cooking meth, but they had to catch them in the act. And to do that, they had to get the go-ahead all the way from the top. Look, it was, it was difficult because I always remember the day I went over to see the, um, the SOG chief inspector, and he's lying in his chair, and I'm giving him a rundown of what's going on and who's who, and I look up and he's gone to sleep on me. <laughs> And I thought, oh, shit, we're off to a good start here. <laughs> anyway, anyway, he gave us a million questions, you know. He said, go and find me three routes there. Find me the quickest route, find me the most direct route, and find me the one where um, is the fallback route if something happens. So that took us about a week to do, just go on in different directions. Along with Hill, there were three other key players in the cooking operation, Roger Biddleston, Ray Hammett and Terry Pog Faulkner. The cops wanted to catch all four at the same time. It was difficult to get the four principals in the laboratory at any one time, or if you did, they'd be gone, one would go before we could get there. So this went on for probably the best part of about a month, and um, we'd have we'd have someone in the farm, Mrs Smith's farmhouse, and he'd, say, he'd be ringing up and he'd say, Smith's here, Biddleston's here, Madden's here, Faulkner's here, Madden, you know, they're all there. So we'd race over and get the SOG and we'd start driving out. And there were no lights and sirens, no, no convoys, anything like that, because th- those guys had, they had lookouts everywhere. That was their area, Templestowe, Wattle Glen, all around there. They, they, they had a lot of contacts out that way. So um, when we did actually catch them all there on the one day, um, a couple of times we missed out. We got halfway there and someone left and we had to come off and come back. We had a lot of debate as to whether we could, sometimes we just settle for what we've got. But in the end, fortunately, I guess I was calling the shots and I thought, well, no, there's no bloody point in doing this half assed Let's just do it the way it should be done. If it takes another week or two, well, so be it. So anyway, this particular evening, it was an evening, it was probably about four o'clock, hot day, uh, daylight saving. Um, and they're all there at four o'clock, so we put the action plan into action. And we, and we get everyone out there about oh, quarter to six, so it took an hour, a bit over an hour to get them there. Caught all four of them there beautifully. Chief Inspector Doug Miller of the Drug Squad said the raids were part of routine investigations after a recent raid on a property at Bottle Glen that it's alleged was being used as an amphetamines factory. Four men were charged and firearms seized in that operation. 36-year-old Roger Biddlestone of Templestowe was charged with possession of a pistol, cannabis and amphetamines. And 31-year-old Peter Hill of Warrandyte was charged with possession of a pistol and trafficking and conspiring to traffic in drugs. But it was interesting, there was a machine gun by the door, a couple of sticks of jelly by another door and another machine gun somewhere and a handgun. And they'd obviously been counting some money. There's a fairly big pile of money there. It might have been 10, 20,000, all with $20 notes. Um, and they were all in little bundles with lacquer bands and all that. So they'd been obviously having a bit of a divvy up. Um, and they were pretty unresponsive. In fact, they were very unresponsive. Um, so they're all bundled up and taken in different cars back to Russell Street. No one knew then that this story would end up involving three trials, one death, two murder contracts, a serious beating, a crooked juror and a police informer. And all this cost the Hells Angels and the police hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you're enjoying this podcast, please remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And remember to rate and comment on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Unless, of course, you don't like it, then shut up. Catching the Hells Angels cooking was one thing, but getting a conviction was going to be much harder. The first trial didn't go as planned because the fix was in. Now, you, let's, let's jump to that first trial. The whisper was, uh, it was a hung jury. Yes, it was a hung jury, it was 11-1. Yeah, 11-1. Uh, the whisper at the time was that um, the jury was off. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, uh, when did you learn that um, the jury member was actually a mate of the Angels? Right. 
Well, initially we went out to the foreman. I don't think we were supposed to do this, but we did it anyway. We'd crack the shits by that stage. And the foreman lived out in Avondale Heights. And we went out and knocked on his door and said, can we speak to you? And he told us that there would be one guy on the on the jury. He was a youngish guy with longer hair and a beard. And he he had dug his heels in every every time. And um, despite something like about five days to the deliberations, there was 11 for convict and one for dismiss. So in the end, it was a hung jury. When we later interviewed Hilly at the, at the hotel in town, Hilly admitted that um, they'd got to one of the jurors. It, he, he was coy about it, but he told us it was a fact and it had happened and they'd paid him and that was that. Here's some audio from that interview with Peter Hill where he admits the Angels had corrupted a juror so they were never going to be found guilty. Towards, I must admit, as an, as an independent observer, uh, well, not independent, as a, a, a biased observer, um, Roger Biddleston uh, was very cocky of the result. Um, some week or so prior to the close of, of the uh, of evidence, um, yes. do you think that Roger would have had? Would Roger have known about this too? And had you been told that um, some assistance would be forthcoming from that jury? Um, yes. right. While Hill and the others were out on bail, they kept cooking meth and bringing in the cash. They're bailed and they're still cooking, I think, aren't they? Yep, yep, yep. When they got bail, there was five of them, no, it was six of them got bail on 20,000. And they produced $120,000 in $20 notes. And all the notes were mouldy and, um, and, and smelled as though they'd been buried in the ground. That's the kids at Steele's place in the background having a disagreement. Clearly, they're not podcast fans. And so they hadn't come from any bank account or anywhere. They'd, uh, they'd come from some alternative source. Yeah. Um, they got to the jury and the angels hadn't finished with the police either. One late afternoon, I was sitting in my drug squad office and uh, I got a phone call from this woman and um, I, got, I still remember the words today. Oh, Mr Waterman, I've heard Peter and his mates have been discussing things in the house and... There's a man coming from America to, to kill you and Mr Armstrong. And he's from the Hells Angels in America. And I thought, Jesus, that's a bit bloody savage. And uh, and, and that woman was... Peter's Aud- mother. Yeah, Audrey. Audrey, yeah. yeah, Audrey. It was a lovely lady. And I'd actually had quite a few conversations. After the tip-off from Peter Hill's mother, Steele had to act fast. I had the foresight. Luckily, I went straight upstairs to the BCI and uh, I spoke to um, Lex Saunders and I said to Lex... Um, can we get all the names of the California chapter and can we put them on alert? And he said, I'll, I'll let you know. And he sent a, a telex. In those days, not like you sent an email today, you get sent a telex, you know, one of those things that go chatter, chatter, chatter. And anyway, about an hour and a half later, he came down to see me. It was about six o'clock at this stage. I'd waited. And he said, I've got 28 names. He said, uh, and I'm going to put them on alert via Canberra. So he did that. So he put them all, all onto uh, the, uh, I think it's called the pass system up yeah, there. Yeah. And uh, I went home. And I didn't think that much more about it, to be honest, because I, uh, you know, I was concerned, but I was a bit disturbed the next morning at 8 o'clock. My phone rang and uh, it was immigration at Melbourne. And they said, well, we've got, a, uh, we've got a, a person that was on that list. He's here in the bloody cells. His name is Brandy's, Jim Brandy's. As cops working the case, Steele and Bob weren't afraid of the angels. But this might have made them think again. Because this angel from America, Jim Brandy's, was a serious killer. James Patton, Jim Jim Brandy. Yeah. No, yeah. Sleepy Jim. He, uh, he was very tasty. He, he blew up um, a copper called Bill Zerby. Um, Bill Zerby, exactly like Bob, yeah. had been pulling him up all the time. Yep. Yeah. And Zerby kept checking under his car for a car bomb. Yeah. But um, 
Brandy's had put the bomb in the in the flower bed next to it. So it blew him up and he lost total hearing in one ear and I think about seventy percent in the other. And he he was he was I think he'd been charged with a triple murder as well. So he was fair yeah. him. He was no joke. Yeah, well that sort of became apparent. He he bought with him um, some wires and some articles on how to build a car bomb. And also he'd written a description on, um, and he had newspaper cuttings of those charges that he'd beaten. Um, he wasn't making any bloody comic charges. The Amiga detectives had a unique way of telling Sleepy Jim they were messing with the wrong type of cops. But he had his colours with him all the time and we took these colours off him and uh, we put them on and got all of us to photograph ourselves with them on. And he was tearing the bloody, he was tearing the cell block apart. And, then lo and behold, someone urinated on him, and that was uh, that got him upset. Oh, imagine it, <laughs> imagine it would. Uh, but he did say to Bob, didn't he? Didn't he say you you do look like Benny Hill? He did, he did. Yeah, he, he, that was his opening comment. Yeah, he said, Jesus, you do look like Benny Hill. So he'd been given a description. Yeah, 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 he, yeah he knew all about it. Yeah. Doesn't get much more hairy than that for both Steele and Bob, and we'll never know what would have happened if Sleepy Jim had got out of the airport. As the trial went on, some of the angels were starting to run out of money because lawyers swallow cash like whales swallow krill. They'd, got le they'd all got legal aid for that, but legal aid, there was seven top silk doing their defence counsel, seven of them. And they all would have been, they would have been $4,000, $5,000 a day briefs back then and the first trial went for no, went five months I think so they, they pretty well chewed up most of their money even their GoFundMe money out of About that. this time after the first trial relations between the original cooking crew began to turn sour one of the angels Ray Hammett had hidden a stockpile of the key chemical for cooking meth called P2P and he refused to give it back this meant the others couldn't cook to make the money for the next trial. Here, Peter Hill talks about how things began to go pear-shaped. Everyone just because of losing money, everyone just blowing as fast as they could get it. All right, well, you and um, you no longer see eye to eye with Ray Hammond. No. Will you tell us uh, what the basis of that falling out of former friends is, is over there? Well, I started off um, look, simply about with disagreement from money, then it should be split up amongst us. And that sort of bit grew from there. After our first trial, um, we got to the stage where we just didn't talk to each other. And because uh, he, he had a considerable amount of feet to feet that he um, put away himself, and then he refused to get back to Russia himself on one of them. And uh, he wanted to see himself up in business, maybe fresh a mess on his own. The relationship between the cooking crew had disintegrated, and one by one, strange things started to happen. One member, John Madden, died in suspicious circumstances. When they used to go on these um, these trips, they'd call them tours and that, uh, they'd always have what they called uh, the backup truck, would always come behind them. And the backup truck's role was if somebody broke down or something happened, they'd be there to put the motorbike in the back of the truck so, you know, the tour could keep going. Anyway, the story is that uh, Madden was the last man. He was tailing Charlie. And the others were a fair bit ahead of him. And he came around the corner, and for whatever reason, he stopped. And his car, his motorbike was in the middle of the road. The backup truck came around the corner, went right over the top of him and killed him. At the time he died, it looked like Madden might be ready to roll over and tell everything to the police. Madden had run out of money, and he was starting to get, starting to give indications that uh, he might cut a deal. He'd, he'd put his fingers out to a few people, but nothing concrete was ever, and it had all gone through his solicitor. But at this stage, Madden broke away. He went with another solicitor, and um, 
indications are that he might want to talk turkey. And uh, how they got to know about it, how the others got to know about it, I don't know. Um, he was actually dead and buried literally before any of us knew about it. Another of the original crew, Roger Biddleston, had a nasty run-in. They tried to hide him under the carpet, literally. Uh, Roger Biddleston, <coughs> um, who one would have thought was probably the shaker and mover out of all of them. He was the one, he was the leader. All of a sudden he turns up in a park in Templestowe, rolled up in a rolled carpet with the absolute crap beaten out of him. He'd been hit with a baseball bat and I think his number had been erased off his arm or his Hells Angels tattoo. He, he had shocking injuries. He, he, did, yeah. he had so many broken bones. Yeah. But, oh, all the limbs, arms, legs yeah. and ribs, I think, yeah. and, and maybe even back, were all broken. Yeah. So he was a hell of a mess. So Roger Hammett was the only one who could cook speed because he had the chemical and he controlled the club. Hill had a bad relationship with Hammett and with one associate dead and another critical... Peter Hill, the son of a banking executive, decided it was time to talk to the cops. And uh, anyway, uh, his mother rang me again and said, uh, Peter would like to talk to you. So Bob and I went to um, see him at a um, pizza hut in um, Templestowe and we sat down there for an hour and a half and we thrashed out the uh, terms of, of what Peter wanted to do and what he expected from it. And uh, what he basically wanted was a letter of comfort. Um, even though he'd been a shaker and mover, he was prepared to roll over and put everyone else in, but he just wanted a letter of comfort, to, in other words, to reduce his own penalty. And he also wanted to be imprisoned away from the others. So these are all things that, you know, the three of us sat down there chewing on a bloody uh, hamburger and fries and and sort of... Hilly could, oh, Hilly could out eat the two of us. Oh, Jesus, he could anyway. <laughs> Hilly's ordered more fries. Anyway. Police ended up interviewing Hilly at a hotel in the city. He, he said, I don't want no piss pot hotel. He said, if you're going to take me somewhere, I want good room service and all this stuff. That was his sense of humour. <laughs> so we did. We took him to that hotel that's it's up the top end of Collins Street. It's a 50-storey place. I forget. I forget it's what it is. Sofitel now. yeah. And um, anyway, so we had to sit in the, where the piano bar was and have a couple of bourbons just to warm him up. Yeah, I know the piano bar. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty interesting people in there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so then we went up to this suite. We thought it was going to take, oh, you know, four hours. We were, we were there for a long time. But then we had to come back the next day. In yeah. fact, we had the room for about three days. And it's, sometimes it was like drawing hen's teeth. And there was a lot of stuff that's not on that tape. You know, we'd... Hill would tell us things and then we'd run through it and put it on the bloody tape. And Hill wasn't always honest. Here he appears a little shy about his cash flow. Have you any idea how much personally you received in terms of money from the sale of, of amphetamine or the manufacture of amphetamine over that 15 month period that you were making it at Green Space? No, it went as fast as I could. I, I, I couldn't. Did you, um, have you got any any money or any assets of that left now? No, I haven't. Have you any idea how much Hammett or Faulkner or whatever may have received? No, it would be on a power that I didn't know. Like something that just couldn't have given Well, if, if we were to just rationalise it in this way, if you used 100 litres of P2P, how many pounds of methamphetamine would you make? 200 pounds. 200 pounds, and it's... And well, say for, you say that that figure of two hundred pound is, is it a is it a reasonable figure? Um, well, no, because that's going to work on one hundred percent yield. You'd have to scale it down to say one hundred and fifty pounds in casual practice. Or, or say one hundred and fifty pound. If you multiply that by twelve thousand a pound, you end up with say something like about one point eight million. That's right. Um, you certainly don't appear to have 1.8 or any part of 1.8 million no, now. That's for sure. He says the money was gone, but after he'd done his time, he did manage to get back on his financial feet pretty quickly. Yeah, he, he obviously came out of it with enough money to buy himself a good rig. And we're probably talking two or three hundred thousand dollars. He bought himself a good rig with a, you know, like one of those big super trucks. And he just, that was it, just disappeared. 
Bob knew where he was all the time and kept in touch with him. Uh, when I say kept in touch, like Hill, Hilly was the sort of bloke who every now and again would ring up and have a joke with you. And, uh, you quite liked him, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I didn't mind him at all. Look, like, I didn't mind any of the guys, to be honest. I... Hilly had the last laugh on them because he took that recipe and he sold it for not very much to the president of the Black Yorlands, <laughs> who was um, um, John William Samuel Higgs. Oh. And Higgs became the biggest speed manufacturer probably in Australia's history. So it all mm. came out of that meeting at Oakland's. Um, you know, Hilly was the one who effectively fathered this massive amphetamines industry with the bikies. Oh, without doubt, without doubt. Hill did his time and kept out of trouble, first as a truck driver and later as a block owner up in Mildura. Ray Hammett was found with speed chemicals at an age when he should have retired. Steele is out of the job and is a successful coin trader and Bob passed away from melanoma. For years, police ignored the bikies, much to Bob's disgust. But when they came back with the Echo Task Force, Armstrong was delighted. In a raid on the Hells Angels, Echo detectives found a ceramic pig wearing a police hat and written underneath was, Bob Armstrong is an expletive deleted. They texted Bob with a photo and told him, hey Bob, they haven't forgotten you. Armstrong was delighted. Naked City is brought to you by The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Subscriptions power our newsroom. So to support independent journalism, consider subscribing to the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. This episode is produced and edited by Margaret Machine Gun Gordon and Anu the Axe Hasbold and mixed and mastered by Jellic Knight John Greenfield with technical assistance from Cool Hand Cormac Lally. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Archival is thanks to Nine, 3 rw 60 Minutes and CBS. I'm John Sylvester. Thanks for listening. Next episode is The Crook and the Cop. Christopher Badner Spins. So I was sitting at the office there one day and the phone rings and it's actually him. In fact, he rang me several times when he was on the run. He started calling me Ashes. He said, I'll put something in the paper. So in the classifieds of the Herald Sun, uh, we'd go right in um, to Ashes, badness is back and bins is back and things like this. 